I'd like to thank you all again very much for coming today. We're going to be speaking about Theodore W. Allen, who lived from 1909 to 2005. Uh, I want to thank in particular Fred Nguyen, who's here videoing for us, and uh, the Commons for letting us use the facility. Now, uh, Theodore W. Allen, Ted Allen, actually lived his last 50 years right here at Brooklyn Avenue and Dean Street. Not far from here, he's a member of the co-op. He worked at the public library what in his latter years. 97 Brooklyn Avenue at Dean Street. And um, we're going to focus particularly on his work, his pioneering work in the 1960s on white skin privilege and culminating in some ways in his magnum opus, the two-volume, The Invention of the White Race, which were first published in 1994 and 1997. There are many other writings that Alan uh, provided us, and I will get into some of this. Now, moving on, here is my web page. Once again, people I encourage to go to the web page. There is all kinds of free information about uh, Theodore W. Allen, Hubert Harrison, lots of links to articles, uh, videos. It's, it's a real resource. I think it's something to be shared with other people. Here is a little brief overview of Allen, who he was and what he did. He's a working class intellectual activist, self-educated. He's born in Indiana, in Indianapolis, and he uh, grows up in West Virginia. He graduates from Huntington, West Virginia High School. I, I think at that time it was right there close to the bottom in uh, most statistical categories, but standard metropolitan statistical areas. And he graduates high school and he goes into the coal mine. Depression, right? He goes into the coal mines. Uh, the story is, and I haven't had it totally verified, but it's been passed down orally, that he went to college one day and found it too confining, and he went into the coal mines. So he's an autodidact, self-educated, but deeply influenced um, in his early years um, by the communist movement, the communist party, and then he's independent of the communist party, but by Marxism and left uh, thinking and writing. But he's always reading on his own and kind of working things out for himself. Uh, he also, when he comes to New York, after he hurts his mind in the back, he's president of three locals of the UMW. So he's a significant union activist and organizer. He's a factory worker, he's a teacher. He works with me in the post office as a mail handler in Jersey City, New Jersey. And uh, in his last years, he was a librarian, as I mentioned, at the Brooklyn Public Library, doing the homework hotline for the youngsters. He pioneers white skin privilege analysis in 1965. Please note the date. That is over 20 years before this wave of uh, white privilege analysis is, uh, associated with the knapsack and these things start. And Allen's analysis is quite different from that. Uh, very uh, thoroughgoing. It's rooted in class and race analysis. And on my webpage, uh, the site I just gave you, you can find some of his early writings. They're really worth uh, reading bec uh, because they influenced, back in my, my youth, they influenced both the student movement and the left very significantly. As I've mentioned previously, in 1969, the New York Times runs a front page article on how the fight against white, uh, white skin privilege um, is the national campaign of SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society, according to the National Office. It's a very lengthy article. Um, so Allen or originates that white skin privilege analysis in 1965. By 74, 75, he's making another great innovation, the invention of the white race analysis. And it, it appears in his pamphlet, Class Struggle and the Origin of Racial Slavery, the Invention of the White Race. We have some copies here, but it's also available free online on my webpage, right? And then his, t again, his big works, The Invention of the White Race, two volumes. Volume one, Racial Oppression and Social Control, and volume two, The Origin of Racial Oppression in Anglo-America. The two volumes, now he also, I want to call to your attention, for those who want to pursue this much more rigorously, Allen himself did a summary of the argument of the invention of the white race in two parts, each is 50 pages long, 
It's available free online. Again, you can link, to, you'll find it on my webpage, the links. It's in Cultural Logic. And this pamphlet, as I mentioned, is available. All of this is available at jeffreybperry.net. Here are some other published writings by Allen that I want to mention to you. White Blind Spot in 1967, co authored with Noel Ignatiev. Uh, at the time, he was using Noel Ignatin. Uh, that was the pamphlet that was reprinted by SDS in the Radical Education Project and had some significant impact. Uh, often packaged with that in the pamphlets that came out was this article by Allen, Can White Workers Crossed Out Radicals Be Radicalized? And that's circa 1969. And we're going to get into some of the content of, of these very briefly. A very important piece in 1973, White Supremacy in U.S. History. Eight, 1978, he does a critical review of Edmund S. Morgan. We will get into Morgan, but Morgan is the, you know, a very significant historian, Yale professor. This book wins all kinds of awards, American Slavery, American Freedom. He's president of the Organization of American Historians. As I've mentioned previously, this is the book that you'll find mentioned in the beginning of Michelle Alexander's book, right? Uh, she, when she goes to do her brief historical summary, she goes to Morgan. You really want to read Alan's profound critique of Morgan. We're going to get into some of that today. In Defense of Affirmative Action in Employment Policy, another article I'd like to call your attention to. Uh, when I'm getting politically active increasingly in the early 70s, this affirmative act action issue was crucial with the Bakke case and the Weber case in employment and a whole host of others, and we still have it impacting us today. Race and Ethnicity, History in the 2000 Census. This is about the Hispanic category with much important historical background. And then this one, a critical review of David Rodiger's The Wages of Whiteness. This is a phrase you hear in the academy a lot, whiteness and things like that. Allen offers what I think is a devastating critique of Rodiger. Not mean-spirited, but I think he really, so I encourage people to read that. Now, what we're going to be going over today is discussed in um, much depth in my own article, The Developing Conjuncture and Some Insights from Hubert Harrison and Theodore W. Allen on the Centrality of the Fight Against White Supremacy. It's at Cultural Logic, but it is also available at the top left at my webpage. If people get to look at that, I encourage you also to look at the last four pages where I have an addendum where I talk about how Daedalus, the American Academy of Arts and Science, who had asked me to write the piece, a much shorter piece, handled it. And I think it's actually a very sad commentary on the Academy, so you might find it of interest. But uh, again, that's the last four pages, the addendum of the article. But that article is, I believe, the most thorough development and analysis of Allen's work. So that's where I think you can find it. Other, I mean, you can read the original Allen, but for somebody who's trying to put it together a little bit, I recommend that. As usual, when I speak about Theodore Allen's work, I open with Harrison. We've gone through Harrison, so I'm going to do this very quickly. As you know, Harrison, 1883-1927, father of Harlem radicalism, race and class conscious, radical internationalist. Key ideological link in the civil, uh, civil rights black liberation movement. Harrison arrives in 1900 from St. Croix in the Virgin Islands, and he encounters a vicious white supremacy unlike anything he's known before. I can't stress this enough. Harrison comments on it, Marcus Garvey, Claude McKay, all these early Afro-Caribbean immigrants. Harrison uses the phrase shocked to describe it. Claude McKay frames it extremely well. He says, when he came to the US, it was the first time I had ever come face to face with such manifest implacable hatred of my race and my feelings were indescribable. I had heard of prejudice in America but never dreamed of it being so intensely bitter. I'm getting at a qualitative difference um, between the Anglo-Caribbean and Anglo-America in terms of the virulence, the viciousness of this white supremacy. The difference, I use Harrison's St. Croix example, but it's also very similar in Barbados and Jamaica in particular. In St. Croix, where Harrison grows up, there's no history of lynch terror, no formal segregation. Caste promotion among people of African descent was fostered to a certain degree. 
and white supremacy was not as virulent or as vicious as in the US. Some of the key reasons why that's the case have to do, it has to do with the class struggle and with the population demographics in particular and the fact that it's an island, right? So in St. Croix, you have 5% European population, 80% of the population was black plantation laborers, 15% colored, if you will, of mixed African and European ancestry. The 5% European could not maintain control over the rest of the population by themselves, so they sought to utilize the 15% free colored to help in that effort. Um, so in, during slavery times, when, when there was slavery in St. Croix, as I indicated, there's a policy of promotion and land holding for a sector of the African descended population. The principal instrument of social control, which was an issue, a question that was raised previously, in St. Croix, the principal in instrument was the militia, and free coloreds served in the militia. And in 1834, in um, St. Croix, there was an edict of full equality passed, a law passed, granting at least nominally full equality between um, free coloreds and Europeans. In contrast, in the U.S., as we know, in contrast to uh, St. Croix and to the Anglo-Caribbean, the general policy was severe racial prescription for African Americans. The, the social control was maintained day in, day out by the slave patrols, which were lily white, no free coloreds in the slave patrols in the U.S. And Negroes, as codified in the Dred Scott decision of 1850, had no rights that a white was bound to respect qualitatively different than the Edict of Full Equality in St. Croix. Couple of more things from Harrison that are crucial from Harrison, but then they, they really take on even added importance when we get to Allen. The co concept of the touchstone, and we've been through this, the touchstone is the black stone. You rub it against the metal to see if it's really the gold it's purported to be. It's a wonderful guide for political action, every issue we look at. Let's put it to the test, housing, uh, employment, unemployment, health care. Rub, how are black people faring? What are we going to do about it? In that same passage, this is from the 1911, when Harrison's writing major theoretical pieces in the Socialist Party press, he goes on to say, the true, essentially, that true democracy and equality implies a revolution startling to even think of. That this issue is so crucial in this country this foreshadows, as I've argued previously, the 1960s when the civil rights black liberation struggle was a catalyst for all these other progressive movements. The labor movement, the women's movement, the student movement, the anti-war movement. So, and and it's, it's so, for the principal reasons that the cause is just and it hits so directly at how the ruling class maintains social control in this country. One or two more key things from Harrison before we get to Allen. It is Harrison who writes in the leading journal of the Socialist Party in 1912, the 10 million Negroes of America form a group that is more essentially proletarian, more essentially working class than any other group, and the Negro was, under slavery, the most thoroughly exploited of the American proletariat. Understanding slavery as capitalism, slave owners as capitalists, black labor as proletarian, crucial. We see it again in Du Bois in 1935 in Black Reconstruction, a book which many consider to have been a major shaping influence on a new interpretation of much of U.S. history. And in Black Reconstruction, we get the kernel and the meaning phrase from Du Bois. Uh, the labor movement, with few exceptions, the labor movement never realized the situation. It never had the intelligence or knowledge as a whole to see in Black Slavery and Reconstruction the kernel and the meaning of the labor movement. Right? And we're going to see this in Allen. Here's the last thing from Harrison for today. When he leaves the Socialist Party, he offers what is arguably the most profound but least heated criticism in the history of the left. The Socialist Party, like the labor movement, has insisted on white race first and class after. It put the white race first before class leads us directly to the question that Alan seeks to address, what is this white race? Here's Alan around the time he's writing uh, in the 60s. On the back of the first edition 
of the invention of the white race in 1994, on the back cover, Allen has this passage. When the first Africans arrived in Virginia in 1619, there were no white people there, nor according to the colonial records would there be for another 60 years. The word white does not appear in a Virginia colonial record until 1691. White identity, as he explains, had to be carefully taught, and it would be another 60 years, right, before it would appear as, a, as an indicator of social status. I want to just emphasize this point. No white people, because when we grow up, we are taught in the schools from day one to the degree that the subject is, oh, well, there were white indentured servants and black slaves, as if it was mm -hmm. that way from the beginning. We're going to stand all that on its head. Alan stands all that on its head, and I hope one of the things is you leave this class, you never pass that on to others, right? Um, there were no white people there. This is the John Punch case. This is the only record of John regarding John Punch. And John Punch, as I mentioned previously, is the person who's related to Barack Obama. And there was a big uh, to-do made about this uh, when Ancestry.com came out about this, because the interesting twist was John Punch, who's of African descent, right, was related to Barack Obama on his mother's side, right? Um, so they, they put wow. an added to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, but here is the only account. And what happens is John Punch is a bond servant, and he's with two others, a fellow named Victor, who's described as a Dutchman, and a Scotchman named James Gregory. And they try to flee their bondage, and they get captured. But if you look at the account, a Dutchman and a Scotchman, they're still not white, right? And this is the only account. Then we are going to talk, we will talk more about Bacon's Rebellion, the big struggle of the 17th century in Virginia, 1676 and 1677. But here is the account of Thomas Grantham, the ship captain who was sent to put down the rebellion. And this rebellion comes after a period of 12 laboring class and bond servant revolts in about 16 years. It was a very volatile context that this is taking place in. And Grantham recounts how I there met about 400 English and Negroes in arms, still not white, who, uh, who were much dissatisfied at the surrender of the point. That's West Point. That's an area down there in Virginia, saying that I had betrayed them. And thereupon, some were for shooting me, and others were for cutting me in pieces. I told them I would willingly surrender myself, that they were all pardoned and freed from their slavery. Most of them I persuaded to go to their homes, which they did, except about 80 Negroes and 20 English, which would not deliver their arms. Still not white. And you go through any colonial record, you're not going to find the word white as a symbol of social status. So Allen argues this is supreme proof that, uh, uh, that the white race did not exist, but the Grantham's testimony is also of profound significance because laboring class African Americans and Europeans had fought side by side for the abolition of slavery back in the 17th century. You wouldn't see that for the next few hundred years, right? So here's the three main theses from Allen's invention of the white race. I have a friend who's an attorney who told me when he goes into court, not that I've ever really done this, but he says, what you have to remember is you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them what you have to tell them, and then you tell them what you told them, right? So here's the three points. You, know, you might hear this again later today, but I want to make sure that you've been introduced to these three theses. First, the white race was invented, invented as a ruling class social control formation, not simply a social construct, but a ruling class social control formation in response to labor solidarity, that what I just showed you, that labor solidarity as manifested in the latter Civil War stages of Bacon's Rebellion. That's number one. Number two, a system of racial privileges was deliberately instituted, conscious ruling class policy. This is not simply, um, what's the phrase they use? Institutional racism, you know, with nobody driving the ship. This is directed by the ruling class, by the late 17th, early 18th century Anglo-American bourgeoisie, and they instituted this system in order to define and establish the white race, and in so doing, establish a system of racial oppression. 
And racial oppression is, uh, is the subtitle, it's in the subtitle of Allen's volume two, which is his most important book. It is the key book in that two volume invention of the white race. Number three, Allen argues, and this is crucial, that the consequence of this system of white privileges and setting up this system of white racial oppression was not only ruinous to the interest of the African Americans, but was also disastrous for European American workers. Disastrous for European American workers. That is qualitatively different than if you go to Wikipedia and you look up white privilege and they tell you all white people benefit from privilege. Clearly the people at the top of society benefit. It's in their interest. They're the ones who push this system. But Allen is arguing very forcefully it is disastrous for European American workers and clearly ruinous to the interests of African Americans. And he argues for the European Americans, their position vis-a-vis -vis the rich and powerful was not improved but weakened by this system of white race privileges. So what Allen's arguing is that the white race is no part of genetic evolution. He's arguing that the white race, as I said, is a ruling class social control formation. Could you just say that again? Uh, it's no part of genetic evolution, okay. right? It's a political, it's done politically, it's a political construct. And it, he's saying it's a ruling class social control formation, not simply a social construct. And why this is important, and I've mentioned this, if you just say that race is a social construct, you leave the back door open for the Dinesh D'Souza's and the Daniel Patrick Moynihan's and all those people who will come and argue, well, yeah, it's a social construct, but what would you expect if people have inferior culture or this or that, right? All these other rationales to explain it. it you know, it's, it's almost, rather than putting it where it belongs, you know, uh, uh, locating the driving force behind this uh, social uh, construct, this social control formation. Allen argues, I come out of the labor movement, this one has great appeal to me and great relevance, I think, uh, hopefully for all of us. The white race is an all-class association. Now this all-class association is very important, I think, because I'm going to be speaking at a sociology convention in another month, and I am going to stress to people, let's break from these charts that say white, black, Asian, and let's break it out by class a little so we don't get a lot of these misleading generalizations that come, right? But the white race is in fact an all-class association of European Americans held together by racial privileges conferred by the, on the laboring class, European Americans relative to African Americans. Conferred, this is from the ruling class, that who's driving the ship, that's who's setting up the system. He argues it is the basic, most prevalent, and historic form of class collaboration in this country. If it's an all-class association and they're aligning together against black labor, for example, that is class collaboration. That's when your co-workers collaborate with the boss against your fellow workers. Right? White supremacism, this is Allen, is the Achilles heel the great weakness of the labor, democratic, and socialist movements in this country. The white race, this creation, has served as the principal historic guarantor of ruling class domination of national life in the US. And this one, very important, I think, white identity is the main barrier to class conscious in the US. He says the main barrier is the incubus, the devil of white identity. And this is very different than a lot of people today who are making a living, you know, talking about, you know, recognize you're white and all this stuff. And you're going to see how when they set up this white race, they had to propagandize people and teach them they were white, right? So Allen's raising profound questions about white identity. Just so you're clear, Allen argues there is nothing positive or progressive in identifying as white. So you've heard it. That's some food for thought, right? So here's the history of Allen's book. This is from Allen, these are Allen's words. He writes this, he goes, he's writing about the period around 1965 when he starts developing his white privilege analysis. And at that point he was fascinated with history, I had an identification with ordinary people, my moral conviction that racial discrimination was a bad thing. Probably like most everybody in this room, right? 
It was the changed ambiance of the African-American civil rights struggle and the peace movement. I was struck by an intuition. He had been through the left. He had been in the Communist Party. He had taught at the Jefferson School for years, right? Political economics. He knew this stuff. He had broken with one of the left groups when the Communist Party um, split apart in the late 50s, right? So he, and then now he was on his own, right? But he had been through this. He was familiar with much of the analysis. And could it, could it be possible that the defeat suffered by the democratic, progressive, populist, and socialist movements was to be found in the infection of white supremacy? That that's the key. He started really thinking about that based on his experience. He had read Du Bois, and he was influenced by Du Bois, who had planted such a seed. So around 65, Allen sets out to look at the three great social crises previously in US history, the period of the 1870s after the Civil War and the Reconstruction period, the populist revolt of the 1890s, and the Great Depression of the 1930s. What Allen finds in those three crises is the following. In those three periods of crisis characterized by general confrontations between capital and urban and rural laboring classes, the key to the defeat of the forces of democracy, labor, and socialism was in each case achieved by ruling class appeals to white supremacism, basically by fostering white skin privilege. And he documents, you know, for these periods, I usually when I do the presentation, I focus on the depression because it's most recent, people are more familiar with it, and we have some very clear, still very living examples right here. And in the depression, the major la labor legislation Fair Labor Standards Act and the National Labor Relations Act, as well as Social Security until 1951, exclude domestic and agricultural workers. 60 to 75 percent of your black and Latin labor force by design. This is government ruling class policy, and why a key reason is FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's troika, his three pronged uh, base of support. Uh, were the urban political machines, the trade unions, and the Dixiecrats, the same crew who were in the Republican Party today. Also, as you'll see when we get into, I won't go into it today, but in some of the welfare and civil rights legislation that develops, you have people like John R. Commons, very influential. These are some of the labor historians, really white supremacists, you know, coming out of Miscon. So there, there's these different forces at play. but. Regarding the Great Depression, the key point here is that the major labor legislation shaped in a white supremacist fashion. The relief is similarly shaped in a white supremacist fashion. It's federal money, it's controlled locally. And that meant particularly down south, black people were denied anything approaching equality. And a key and crucial one is the GI Bill. The GI Bill, you get a house with zero down payment and low interest loan. And the statistics for us right here where we live, New York, New Jersey area, 67,000 GI loans are awarded, less than 100 go to families of color. That's how you get the ring of white suburbs around New York and every city in the country. This is federal legislation. Every city in the country. And the last one, and one that I think should be on the, in the forefront of every labor movement activist in this country, is the unemployment ratio. It's two to one, black to white. It's all it's been as long as anyone in this room has been alive. In 1929, at the start of the Great Depression, the black to white unemployment ratio was one to one, which makes sense because black people were brought here to labor, so they were laboring, right? But it's after all the programs of the New Deal and the post-war de uh, deployment, redeployment, that the, uh, by 1947, the black to white unemployment ratio, as much as they play with it, the black to white unemployment ratio was two to one, and that's all it's been ever since, or some close variant of it. Um, yes? Um, for the excluding of the domestic and agricultural workers, what was the justification that they gave for excluding the domestic and agricultural they, 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 This has to do with their conception of what was real kind of industrial or, or labor work. It has to do with the definition yeah, but of if work. You read, if you read yeah. um, a, a great reference to this is a 2005 book by Ira Katznelson, who's at Columbia University. has a book called When Affirmative Action Was White. And in that book, he gives quotes from the congressional record where they were debating these things. And the Southern Democrats, who Jeff has referred to as the Dixiecrats, who later called themselves the Dixiecrats after 1948, 
the Southern Democrats um, explicitly argued that they were not, they didn't want to give, again, he has quotes from the Congressional, where, where they argued these, they didn't want to give black people basically these privileges. They wanted local control over the distribution of- These benefits. Ben yes. All these benefits, yes. and they, they definitely, they, and they knew that excluding agricultural workers and domestics would exclude most black people from any of these benefits. And that was really the motivation. It's quite amazing. I really recommend that book. I yes. Yeah, that one, and he's got a new one out, Katz Nelson Fear. Yeah. Yeah. What's the name of the author? When Alec Katz Nelson. I-R-A, and his last name is Katz Nelson, K-A-T-Z, N E L S O N. K A T Z. Well, one thing, I'm going to, I'm going to field this question, but I want to say one thing. They told us we only have until 1220 oh, today, no. so okay. I want to try and get through the presentation, and then we're all outside where we can discuss much of this okay. later, all right, if you stick with me. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> with that intro. Yeah, you said earlier that uh, black people were excluded from Social Security until, until 1951. Yeah. It was a and, change in the law. And when, when did Social Security start? In, I, I think in that 35 period, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and again, was it explicitly because yeah. they were black? So, so all of the new deal yeah. programs were done that way. But, um, all right. So I'm going to go on, we're going to roll through this, and then we, we can do the questions. Um, Allen, in one of his writings shortly after this six, late 60s period, in the early 70s, he makes a very interesting argument that the history of class struggle in this country can, can be interpreted as a five-stage cycle. Now, this is not rigging, you know, it's got to, but it it's just gives you a little glimpse of um, how he, he thinks we can best understand some of this. In the normal course of capital uh, developments, there's a deterioration in conditions for working people. At a certain point, as conditions start deteriorating, some of the white workers' privileges even get affected, right? And they're somewhat drained. That's stage two. In stage three, with that, with that happening, the white workers manifest a tendency of showing some solidarity with black workers. All of a sudden, let's talk class brothers and sisters, the early, the Occupy, right? You know, people starting talking about this. And then what Allen argues, what has historically happened is the bourgeoisie, the ruling class, moves to resubstantiate the race privileges. And unfortunately, what has happened historically, and this is why we have to learn these lessons, is the white workers have taken what Allen refers to as the poison bait. The white race privileges, he says, are a poison bait. They're like a shot of heroin. The true slogan for the labor movement is solidarity forever, privileges never, right? That's the slogan. That's what we've got to be pushing. So, and so, but what has historically happened is the white workers have taken the bait, broken solidarity with black workers, and, you know, gone back to making themselves uh, subject to the powers that be. Now, Allen does another thing in this early period. We're going to get to the white race. He looks at U.S. labor history, and now this is in 1965, but he argues against what he refers to as the general consensus of U.S. labor history. And he, it, that consensus is trying to explain, because one of the great questions is why is it that the U.S., as compared to other advanced capitalist countries, particularly, say, Germany, France, even England, you know, um, we, we don't have a, a, a labor party of any significance. We don't have a significant third party, Democrat or socialist. You know, we've never been able to build those. How do you explain the relative uh, low level consciousness of the working class in this country? And in order to explain that, Allen goes through leading left and labor commentators on it. So he's not afraid to, you know, pick issues here with some key names. Frederick Engels, Marx's co-worker. Frederick A. Sorg, who translates capital into English here, you know, in, uh, in the U.S. Eli, the Christian socialist. Hillquit, the, from the uh, major figure in the Socialist Party. William Z. Foster, dominant figure in the history of the Communist Party, right? John R. Commons, who I mentioned earlier. Perlman, who's Commons associate. Charles and Mary Be Beard. Frederick Jackson Turner. Nevins and Cominger. These are the leading historians who've, who've written on this, and they've come up with what Allen describes as a six-pronged rationale. And the six arguments that they make, and he, he quotes from each one, you know, maybe two are making this one, two are making that one, that the reason for the low level of class consciousness in the U.S., the relatively low level, is the early right to vote and other constitutional liberties that we've had in this country, the heterogeneity of the workforce, 
the free land safety and valve. In what sense? We're, 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 gonna, we're answering questions. Can we do it later? Just let me, let me get through it. And uh, higher wages, social mobility, aristocracy of labor, the precedence of trade unions over a labor party which facilitated anti-socialist, anti-labor party practices. Th these are the arguments. So what Allen's response is, is he challenged this old, uh, old consensus by saying it had erroneous assumptions, it's one-sided, it's exaggerated, and above all, it's white blind. So here he goes into a little. For instance, and I've, I've pulled some here because I, I have to get to where we're going still, but analysis, and these are in the article, can white workers uh, be radicalized and white blinds, but you'll find in detail what I'm talking about. Uh, analysis complete, oh, completely refutes or at least casts grave doubt upon many of the assumptions Freeland safety valve theory has been thoroughly discredited. Basically, working people weren't getting the free land. They were going to railroads and the people who had money, you know, and things like that for the most part, right? The heterogeneity, which they're arguing is a weakness, may well have been a strength. As we talked about last week, uh, two weeks ago, in the history of the Socialist Party, all these immigrants were a major radical impetus, you know, and, uh, and Harrison and people coming from the Caribbean, people from elsewhere have been a major radical impetus. So it's not necessarily a weakness. It could be a strength. It has been. Um, the rise of mass non-aristocratic industrial unions like the CIO and the like has not broken the basic pattern, you know, that was uh, blaming it on the labor aristocracy. And the language problem in labor agitation and organizing hasn't been proved to be insurmountable. Um, so Allen argues that the classical consensus must be decisively altered when examined in the light of the centrality of the question of white supremacy and of white skin privileges. Again, I, I ask people, if you just make notes, we, we will try and address and talk about all these things, but I want to get through this because we, we started a few minutes late and we're really locked on time today. Free land, constitutional liberties, immigration, higher wages, all were white skin privileges, and Allen argues that and shows that. And he, um, whatever their effect upon the thinking of white workers, the same cannot be said about black workers, right? So his response, he counters with his own theory, again, this is where he brings his theory in, that white supremacy reinforced by white skin privileges was the main retardant of working class consciousness. And he extends that to say that efforts at radical social change should direct principal efforts at challenging the system of white supremacy and white skin privilege. So this is what he's arguing in the uh, 60s. Um, and he considered it, a, uh, um, when he's writing this, a matter of, because this is the 60s, this is the civil rights black liberation struggle, right? The, the country, we see a little of this in Ferguson, but it was like that so much when we were growing up, right? And people were talking and concerned about these issues and learning some in the process. And he says, in that context, uh, it was good that people were beginning to ask the question, can the white workers be radicalized, right? It was finally some focus on this. And to go on, uh, what he asks, he, what he tries to point out is to ask, can the white workers be radicalized, ultimately comes down to this question. Is it in their interest to become radical? Because if you think uh, where, where he's going with this is going to take on the argument that white workers benefit, right? So he, he's, he's challenging, you know, the, you know he's, he's laying the groundwork for where he's going. All right, he does a few other things, <laughs> which I'm going to just do briefly here, but they are in those articles I'm mentioning. He, he, he discusses things that he calls the artful dodges, reasons given why people, particularly on the left, don't place the fight against white supremacy and white skin privilege is central. So here's some of the artful dodges. One. The way to handle the problem of white is not to take anything away from the whites, but to give something to the blacks, right? You've probably heard these. I, I know groups that articulate. And Allen argues that's one sure way of perpetuating white skin privileges. This is through the fair employment, through full employment. I have people, you know, people I know, good people, who say, Jeff, why don't we just, jobs for all. How can anybody be opposed to that? And, but even full employment, at its best, it was 4% unemployed, you know, and now they, I think they consider it 6 or 7. But if you don't challenge that 2 to 1 ratio, if you're not challenging that, it's going to continue to persist and you've got the same problems, right? Um, so Alan's arguing that's not dealing with the issue at all. Another ar artful dodge, he says, is the new working class. The technical specialists and educators will be able to deal with this because they're not caught in the hurly-burly confrontation over jobs with black workers. This 
you know, for people who want to probe this more deeply, this could get into a lot of that white privilege analysis today because a lot of the people that are appealed to are people who have these, you know, mid-level jobs and things like that, you know, and they're um, doing some social work and things like that. And, but it's, it, what Alan's arguing is, um, uh, he's saying, the argument is that because of their strategic place in the economy, they're, they're not tainted so much by uh, the white supremacy of the lower orders, and, uh, but Alan argues, listen, workers have to compete. This is part of the struggle. We've got to start addressing these qu questions. We can't duck and dodge from them. And the reason for the white supremacist infection is the white skin privilege, which the power structure confers on the white workers at all levels, right? Another one is the new working class. Uh, uh, well, this is the, what he's talking. Another one is one you will hear, and I've heard this from very good labor uh, activists, and theoreticians that the immediate interests of black and white labor are in conflict, but the long-range interests are in common. Uh, we need parallel struggles, you know, so black workers, you know, organize and we'll organize over here and then we'll come together down the road. And Alan basically argues you're not going to get to that position down the road if you're not waging this struggle now. And um, Another argument current is that a depression will reduce the privileges and then the white workers will show solidarity, right? You know, depression comes, times get hard. And his basic argument, well, if you think that, you have to explain why it didn't happen the three previous times. And then another one is don't waste time on white workers. They can't be won to revolution. Support national liberation struggles and things like this. Now, this is where a sector in the early period, a sector of the new left who started speaking about white skin privilege went. That's the, like the group called Weathermen, if people are familiar way back, because they basically did not think that the white workers could be won. So they supported the national liberation and went in a different direction. And there are groups like that today, right? I mean, of the same analysis um, that, you know, we, we've, got, we've got to support allies, you hear all this allies, you got to be allies of these struggles. And Alan, Alan's, Alan's trying to argue the most meaningful support you can give is to wage a struggle against white supremacy right here, right? Um, so, and he goes through all of these artful dodges. Again, this was very brief, not as well as I would like to have done it, but you can read them. You can read them on, online and in the article. And what he argues then led him to offer a strategic direction for social change efforts. This is another lesson I would hope people at least would consider coming out of these sessions. Because a key element for those of us on the left who would like to see social change is what is the strategic direction of this movement? It's a key question for any movement. What, what's the key? What do we got to do to make this change? And Allen argues that strategically the key for the strategic main blow for progressive social change must be aimed at the most vulnerable point at which a decisive blow can be struck, white supremacy. He argues white supremacy is what they rely on, and white supremacy, if we're clear, it is not in our interest, so we've got to take them on on that issue, and we've got to beat them on that issue if we want to move forward. So every issue we look at, we've got to look at how it's shaping, because that's what they're going to use to try and beat us back, and they've successfully done it in the past. Getting back now, we're going to get back to the invention of the white race. After five years or so of doing this analysis that I've briefly tried to describe, Allen's writing on the three crises in particular, a new book comes out by Winthrop D. Jordan. It wins the National Book Award and several, uh, several others, and that book is White Over Black, American Attitudes Towards the Negro, 1550 to 1812. And what that book essentially says, according to Jordan, uh, was is that white supremacy is just naturally the way white people are. Jordan uses the phrase unthinking decision. It is the counter, the ideological counter in the universities to the struggles of the 1960s. You've got the civil rights, black liberation struggle challenging white supremacy, and here's going to come the response. And we're going to see it in the Wallace campaign politically. At the university level, we'll see it in things like Jordan's analysis. So Allen knows the importance of what Jordan is raising. He says, I've got to drop what I'm doing, and I've got to deal with this. I've got to go back to the 17th century. Um, so Allen became convinced that the problems related to white supremacy couldn't be resolved 
without a history of the plantation colonies of the 17th and 18th century. His reasoning was clear. White supremacy still ruled in the US more than a century after the abolition of slavery. That had to be explained. The racism as na uh, is natural argument association associated with Jordan wouldn't do. So Allen wanted to look for a structural principle, something that was similar in the situation we have now, which was similar to what they had back then, and essential to the social order based on enslaved labor, and still essential. And that's going to be this whole system of white supremacy, white skin privilege, right? So here's Allen, closer to the time when he's getting ready to publish, right? Uh, the two volumes come out. This is the two volume. This is the new edition of the two volume work. Now I want to talk about this. Two volumes, 94, 97, the new expanded edition in 2012. The titles, very important to pay attention to. Racial Oppression and Social Control. Allen's offering essentially a Marx-based analysis of racial oppression, right? We've had stuff on a national question on that. Racial oppression. And social control is key. He constantly reiterates two key tasks for the bourgeoisie, for the ruling class. They want to make profits, they got to maintain social control, right? Just like the politics, you know, the social control, they got to do it. Number two, number two, the origin, singular, of racial oppression in Anglo-America, here, right? On Allen's precision with words, I just want to go over this quickly. He argues origin, not origins, for the, of racial slavery. Origin has a desired specificity. He uses examples of Darwin's origin of species, Engels' origin of the family, private property. It's to be consistent with the argument of this book. Allen is arguing class struggle is the origin of racial oppression, right? It's got to do with class struggle, ruling class efforts to maintain social control. Is his book is not about, nor does it pretend to be about racism. And why this is important is for 14 years, in the first edition, Verso, the publisher of the book, had across the back a quote by an author of a book called The Wages of Whiteness, we're going to get in whiteness in a second, said that Allen's book is about the origins of the birth of racism. That's now, Alan says, my book's not about origins, my book's not about racism, and it's not about whiteness. But this is how it's getting promoted by the people who publish it, right? There's mu much more to that story. But here's what he says about racism. I, shied away from, I shy away from the use of the self-standing uh, term racism. And there's groups, very prominent groups today, that, that use this racism all the time. He goes, my book is about the white race, the true peculiar institution. Now, peculiar institution, if you're not familiar with that phrase, that was the phrase the slave owners used to use in the period of slavery, when they wouldn't utter it, just like they wouldn't put slavery into the Constitution, they wouldn't put the word in the Constitution. And they would often use it, peculiar institution, with a sneer and a wink, you know, because they knew what it meant, you know? And, and they're talking about slavery, right? And Allen, what Allen is doing in so many steps, in so many points, is he's standing existing U.S. history on its head. He says, no, you got it all wrong. The real peculiar institution is this white race. This is new. It's created here. It's peculiar, right? And um, so, but he also avoids the use of the self-standing word racism on account of the ruinous ambiguity which white supremacists have managed to give it. And one of the arguments is, if you just use racism, belief in race, you know, this and that, the argument comes out, sometimes I've seen it in groups I've worked with and stuff, well, yeah, black people are racist, white people are racist, you know, you get very even-handed about it. And he's saying, no, we want to use, we want to use white, white supremacy, white supremacism, because it targets where the real, re, the major problem is, you know, we've got to deal with this. Um, going on. On whiteness, Allen stays away from the term whiteness, in quotes, he explains it's an abstract noun, it's an abstraction, it's an attribute of some people, it is not the role they play. The white race is an actual objective thing, not biologically, but it's a political, cre it's a political creation. It exists, it functions, right? It functions in this history of ours and it has to be recognized. To slough it off under the heading of whiteness is to me seems to get away from the basic white race identity trauma. And when he uses identity trauma, he's talking about this, it, this, this is, 
it, it's a damage. It's a damage that's done, this white race identity. All right. Now, with some of that on the words, here's what volume one looks like, if people haven't gotten it. And I want to encourage people, if they're serious about this stuff, to read the two volumes, Invention of the White Race. And I want to encourage you, if you're going to begin with one volume, begin with volume two. It is that important. Um, but, uh, and I, I also want to say, I've got lots of friends, activists, academics and things, people who even will praise Alan's work. Most of them have not read them. This is, these are not easy books to read. They're 800 pages, they're 35% Footnotes and appendices, small print. There's a lot of work. You've got to work at this, but it's worth it if you will do it. But in this era today, with you know all of this going on, and, you know people spend their time on a lot of things, and I don't do this serious reading. So just yesterday, uh, one of the outstanding activists in New York City area, and I just mentioned. By the way, did you get to read that? Oh, Jeff, I've been meaning to. You know, and he's doing many wonderful things. But this is somebody who works in this area all the time. I think it, it's an important tool. It will really help in the struggle against, and I, I recommend individuals, organizations, study groups, whatever, read this seriously. And with that in mind, I try to do some things that would help you to do that, right? So in this new second edition, I wrote front and back matter. I went through and I edited. There were a few little mistakes that Alan left notes from the originals. We made those corrections. But here, look at, here's the contents. It's the anatomy of racial oppression. He analyzed what is this racial oppression. Social control and intermediate strata. And he starts talking about Ireland. Because what Alan's going to do in volume one, Jordan is, is saying, you know, it's an unthinking decision. It's automatic. It's, you know, it's, and it all comes back to phenotype. You know, it's got to be this way. So Alan is going to look at Ireland. He calls it the mirror of Irish history to show us an example of essentially the same type of treatment, right, of a people, right? But people with the same phenotype as the people who are doing it to him. But he's got to do more than that, too. But so he goes into Irish history, right? And for many people in the U.S., that's another reason. They, get, they go into volume one, they're not familiar with this history, so it's hard, right? We're not familiar. Um, Protestant ascendancy. Protestant ascendancy, the way it works in Ireland, and we'll get into that, but it's the Protestants who get, that's how they, that's how they try and coalesce certain forces, right? The, the, uh, the Anglicans and the Presbyterians against the Irish Catholics, right? And so he talks about Protestant ascendancy being essentially very similar to white supremacy. Social control from racial to national oppression. He dis describes the distinction between racial and national oppression. Ulster, Anglo-America, the sea change, what he's referring to in the sea change is how when Irish laborers, victims of racial oppression in Ireland, vicious racial oppression, come here to the U.S. in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, and within a generation or two, they are not only opponents of abolition, but they're some of the staunchest advocates, and they're attacking the black community. He calls that a sea change. And he talks about how that gets done. I'm going to show you a slide or two on that in a second. But he also, in volume one, it's not just reading the, um, uh, the chapters. You, ha you, have to, you can go and get much out of the footnotes and the appendices. So he talks about intermarriage, the cheaper labor rationale, why, why you know, blacks were enslaved, cheaper labor. But it, that's not the case in the early period. The cheapest labor for England in the early period is bringing them from Ireland and England, right? He goes through, and he's a, he knows this. He's an economist. He understands. He backs it up. Allen understands the important arguments that are going to get raised at each stage. He brings them up, and he tries to address them in their best light. This is real serious scholarship, right? Uh, African strength is a limit to English conversation. The Europeans couldn't really go into the continent. Africans still control the continent. He, he talks about that. There's a lot of misconceptions. English plantations in Ireland. Um, Mountjoy. Mountjoy's starvation strategy. This is some of the most vicious stuff in the history of the world, what they did to Irish. And he talks about Gilbert coming and they lining the heads up of the victims, you know, and the, so the families had to march down the rows. And, you know, social control policies of Western colonizing power. And this last one, Scottish slavery. Again, people may not be familiar, but from 1606 to 1797, Scottish coal miners and salt pan workers were enslaved. 
by people of the exact same you, if you will, right? Uh, other appendices, the relative cost, see he gets into economic analysis, relative cost, a lot of the argument, the, the rationales, the apologies for what gets done. He tears them up, right? Daniel O'Connell, big figure in Irish history, talks about John Hughes, who's a um, leading Catholic uh, religious leader here in New York who goes from an opponent of slavery to one of the big proponents of uh, whiteness, <laughs> not whiteness, this whole white appeal to these Irish Catholics and uh, opposition to slavery. Um, now, in the back, a couple of things I do, I offer in the book an appendix, but what I want to call your attention to is in each volume, there's an editor's appendix, which I did. They're about 25 pages each, and they go through chapter by chapter what Alan's trying to do. And because these are difficult works, I think this can be used as you're reading, you know, to make sure, you know, if you want to do study group or study guide, I think people, I encourage people to use the, um, this one, this, in volume one, it's called Notes to Encourage Engagement with volume one, got a chronology, and in each volume, I did greatly expanded indexes so you can find whatever you want in these books. But unfortunately, as we went to print, Verso, the editor, said that the index had to be cut. In particular, volume two, the key work, and the index was cut by one third. And, um, but what made that so glaringly bad was when the books came out at the end of each volume, there were 14 blank pages, right? Um, yeah, so, and this is, they're, they, they're considered the leading left publisher in the English speaking world. So last night I sent off another letter to them because what I'm suggesting is I've, got to, I've done all the work, let's get it up on the web page or someplace, let's make this available, right? You just got to keep moving on, you know, but there's much to that history that I'm describing. Volume two, this is the key. Alan said, This is my best. This is my life's work. This is the book he set out starting to write after Jordan. He wound up doing the other things for a host of reasons, which I, we can discuss out in the street, right? But um, so labor problem, here's the labor problems of the European colonizing powers, the plantation of bondage, he goes into uh, English background, labor supply, Euro-Indian relations, we're going to go through this in a second, fateful addiction to Baxio, road to rebellion, uh, part four rebellion reaction, invention of the white race, please pay attention, he gives great care to his titles, again, the very important footnotes about maroon communities in the Americas, what Tyler's rebellion, the bond labor system. These get in very precise detail and address key historical and theoretical issues. Please, you know, I'm encouraging people to read them. So now we're going to go briefly with what he does, volume one. Allen reviews the historical debate on the relationship of slavery and racism. And he offers a critical examination of the two main lines of historiography. Very briefly, this was actually put at the end of his proposed manuscript, but the editor said, oh, why don't you bring this up, and a host of things went on. So it's, it's put at the front. But he breaks the historian's writing on the subject into two main groups, the psychocultural, Winthrop Jordan is one of the big ones, another fellow named Carl Degler, and a host of people who take a more socioeconomic approach. Uh, Oscar and Mary Hanlon, Edmund Morgan, who I mentioned, Eric Williams from Trinidad, Timothy Breen. Allen is really much of this ilk. He likes many of their arguments, but he finds weaknesses. He's totally opposed to their arguments, but he finds certain weaknesses in each one which he describes. So I encourage people to look at them. Of all the historians writing on the topic, the one he thinks really gets it best is Lerone Bennett, Jr., senior editor of Ebony Magazine, author many people may have read before the Mayflower, but in particular he's referring to Bennett's book, The Shaping of Black America in which Bennett essentially makes the same three arguments that Allen does, right? So Allen is ultimately, now he's a laboring person, a working class activist, so he's going after the two main arguments that he believes undermine struggles by European Americans against white supremacy. He thinks these are the two main arguments. The first one, that racism is innate. I know you've heard this, but it's worth repeating. If racism is innate, why fight it? You're not going to change anything. He's going after that argument. The second argument that white workers benefit. I, I, came, I, I came up to Port Authority today because I, I, I didn't have my car. I didn't have my car. I take that A train all the way down. I'm past the church on Third Street. Don't be telling me people at work and people are benefiting in this society. This is crazy. We got, you know, people suffering all over. 
Uh, the idea that white workers benefit from white race privileges. Allen argues that European American workers, uh, white race privileges are a poison bait like a shot of heroin. They look good, they're not in your interest, they're not interested in the interest of the class, they're not in the interest of change in this society. We've got to challenge them. The unthinking decision, as we've stated, was Winthrop G. Jordan. The too few uh, free poor. This is Edmund Morgan. I mentioned earlier, Morgan is the historian that Michelle Alexander cites in um, uh, New Jim Crow, right? Morgan makes the argument, he, he makes two arguments, and I want to introduce you to them. One argument Morgan basically makes is that in, seven, in the 18th, in 1700s Virginia, there were too few free poor Europeans on hand to matter, as if they're getting promoted to the middle class. That's historically not true. You've got the poor, South, poor whites throughout the South, and Allen goes through the historians who've actually researched in this argument, in this area, and challenges Morgan very seriously. And that's crucial because what Mor this is the Morgan's argument, the too free, few poor, is basically the argument that these white workers are benefiting, right? So he goes after that. But Morgan does more, and I want you to please follow what I'm saying because this gets so fundamental to the history that we've been taught. He, he was the past president of OAHS, but uh, he offers a master narrative. His book is, pay attention to the title. What's OAH? Organization of American Historians. Okay, American Slavery, American Freedom, right? Slavery is the rock upon which all the great freedoms get built. That's where he's going with it. Now watch what Allen does, right? He, so Morgan offers a master narr narrative which Allen described as an assessment of white supremacism in a positive light. In essence to Allen, Morgan's thesis was that democracy and equality as represented in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, we know that's been subject to some real scrutiny recently again, right? Were made possible by racial oppression. Listen, what he's, Morgan's arguing is these great liberties we have were made possible by racial slavery. Mustn't have been a bad thing if we got all these great liberties. I mean, that's the argument. This is the dean. This is, this is the one I said, Michelle Alexander. This is, this is what is out there. He's considered the best in the, in, the, in the academy of the major academics, right? Or as Morgan stated it, the slavery of Afro-Americans made possible indeed was essential. This is Morgan's quote for the emergence of the notion of equality as a fundamental constitutional principle of the United States. Now, briefly, because I, I want to get on to more things, but what Allen is going to do is go to stand that totally on its head. And rather than slavery being the basis for all these great freedoms, he's going to take us back to Bacon's Rebellion when they rise up fighting hand in hand in a period when there's all these struggles. And he's going to point out to try and enslave anybody in that period would be like adding uh, kerosene to the Jamestown fire. He goes, you got to be nuts. They, they had no social control in Virginia in late 17th, uh, 17th century. So he says it is only by giving what were rights in England, you know, as racial privileges in the U.S. to these Europeans in the process of creating this white race, it is only by giving these privileges the, you know, that you can get to racial slavery. You couldn't have developed a system without you because you couldn't maintain control. So rather than slavery making the, liber the liberties possible, he says the liberties extended only as racial privileges makes the slavery impossible. He stands it totally on its head. Very important. Rethink, you know, and there's many implications for this, which I hope future generations will really do much more with. Um, so what Allen is trying to do, he says, it's not enough to just criticize Morgan and Jordan. You have to develop a self-standing oppositional theory, you know, that makes sense, that can be built off and stuff. And that's what he's trying to contribute towards, not, you know, not the only one. Um, and again, here's his thesis. Uh, he thinks we have to chain, challenge white supremacy. All right, now in volume one, what he go goes um, on doing early in volume one, he looks at some of the howling absurdities of race. This is what he calls it. And this is because, again, he wants to move beyond phenotype understanding to look at the nature of the oppression. So these are some of the examples he cites. I'll do these, but sometimes it's a nice little break when we're doing slides. 
He talks about colonial Hispanic America. It was said that people could purchase a royal certificate of whiteness, right? That was what was said. In Brazil, money whitens, a slogan, you know, that people would utter for centuries. And, uh, no such whitening was recognized in the U.S. Very good example, 1890, a Portuguese emigrant settling in Guyana, that was British Guiana back then, would learn that he or she was not white. But a sibling, same family member of that person arriving in the U.S., would learn that they are white. They're white here, right? It's different definitions. But then he brings it a little more closer to home. Moving up from Guiana now, we're... We're uh, to Cuba, 1907, same census, well, same year, two different controlling powers. Spanish are on the way out, their census, Mexican Indians and Chinese were classified as white. U.S. comes and says, no, you don't got it right. Same groups are classified as colored. I mean, this is how we do things here, this is our, our hemisphere. <laughs> uh, howling absurdities, Virginia laws, 1860, a person with three white grandparents was a Negro, one quarter. 1907, having no more than 15 out of 16 white great grandparents classified as a Negro. 1910, every person in whom there was an ascertainable, any Negro blood was to be deemed a colored person. That's the one drop rule. In the face of such absurdities, Allen developed, he gives more examples, but he gives more examples. Allen views racial oppression as a social rather than a skin-based phenomenon. And his focus is primarily not on why the bourgeoisie had recourse to slavery. Because one of the points Allen's going to make is that they know no limits to how cruel and inhumane they will be, this bourgeoisie. They will do what they can get away with. And we see it every day as we read the papers in this world. But we know that the English in Scotland had slavery. We know that they had what was called the Irish slave trade. We know that in, six, or you're going to see, from 1647 to 1650, in England, England imposed slavery on vagabonds in their own country, their own English vagabonds. So they, they, they know no bounds, right? So Allen is going to, the key issue is focused not on why the bourgeoisie has recourse to slavery, because they will do it. They will do it if they can get away with it. But it is how they maintain social control. And in the question of how they maintain social control is where we st really start getting into these race questions and national questions and things like that. So here's a core argument that Alan makes in the course of this volume one. A comparative study, and he goes through this in great detail, of Anglo-Norman rule and Protestant ascendancy. Anglo-Norman rule goes way back to the early 1300s in Ireland. But why that's important is it's pre-capitalism. So it's not, you know, people got to just say, well, capitalism brings this. No, you got to look at the nature of the society. But he says in these two periods in Ireland, a comparative study shows that what was established there was very similar to the white supremacy that gets developed in continental Anglo-American. And he, that's one of his arguments to show that racial oppression is not dependent on skin color, right? Because outwardly, the Anglo-Normans and the Protestants are the same skin color as, European, as the Irish. But he goes further. He, when he looks at specific examples of racial oppression, he dis discusses African Americans, both pre and post. And why I say post, this is important, again, getting back to the Verso book. If you look at the back cover of volume two of the Verso book, they imply that racial oppression ends when slavery ends. But that's not Allen's argument at all. One of Allen's key arguments is ra racial oppression is reconstituted and, you know, this is what we have today, right? And uh, so it's very important to understand Allen describing racial oppression both pre- and post-emancipation. He argues, and you'll find this an interesting argument, we can talk about it outside, but the racial oppression of the uh, American Indians, he really focuses on the 19th century, not the early period, for reasons he goes into, right? And he talks about the Irish in the early period, 13th century that I mentioned earlier. All right. Now, difference in social control of racial oppression and national oppression. As I said, Alan's making an analysis of racial oppression. <coughs> national oppression, here's what he argues are some of the differences, right? In racial oppression, the intermediate both buffer social control stratum is recruited from the oppressor group. The key to maintaining social control is a sector, particularly in, in the U.S., what we're going to see, is the laboring and semi, the proletarian and semi-proletarian, quote, whites, is the key to maintaining racial oppression. 
Um, and social distinctions within oppressed group are denied. This is what we, we will see when we get back in 17th century Virginia, and basically the notion that no black person has any rights to uh, a white is bound to respect. In national oppression, Allen argues, this buffer social control statum, the key that holds it in place, is recruited from a sector of the oppressed group. They get promoted, the, the national bourgeoisie, the, you know, whatever it's called. And social distinctions, to a degree, within the oppressed group are fostered. So these are two, what he's arguing, they're both forms of uh, oppression, right? They're both vicious, right? You can have vicious national oppression, but we want to understand the nature of the oppression if we're going to try and deal with it, all right? So in Virginia, after Bacon's Rebellion, persons of discernible non-European ancestry were denied a role in the social control buffer. They're not in, they're not in that Lily White slave patrol, right? That's a Lily White slave patrol. By contrast, in the Anglo-Caribbean, particularly uh, Barbados and Jamaica, what he's focusing on, mulattoes were included in the social control group. They're promoted into middle class status. I've, show, I've shown you previously, Harrison's born in an estate owned by two men of color. In Jamaica, on the eve of emancipation in the 1830s, 23% of the enslaved population were owned by people of color. It is a different type of social control. Um, and the difference is rooted in part in the objective fact that in the West Indies there were too few laboring class Europeans. Because amongst the difference, see it's all got to do with this class struggle, but these Caribbean uh, places are islands, so there's a limit to how much space is, you know, as opposed to here. Um, they turn to sugar production for most of the reasons that he goes into, right? Sugar is more capital intensive. You need, you know, bigger plantation. So the smaller Europeans, even after they get out of bondage or whatever, they're increasingly fleeing, they're getting off, and there's only, there's only a, a small handful that remain. So to maintain social control, the ruling elite brings in a sector of the free colors, right? That's what they do. So, but in, in the continental colonies, and this we're going to get into, meaning particularly here, Virginia, Maryland, the pattern setting colonies, it's not that there's too few Europeans, there's too many. And they don't want to promote all these laboring class Europeans up, you know, into middle class. So they're going to sell them a bill of goods. You know, they're going to sell them on this white race thing, right? So, all right, so here we go on. He talks, as I said, about the sea change of the Irish. This is still in volume one how the opponents of racial oppression in Ireland became opponents of abolition, supporters of racial oppression here. But again, Allen is focusing on the ruling class role in all of this. So he plays particular attention to the plantation elite and related financial interests. There's a lot more been coming out about this, particularly up in the Northeast, about related fi financial interests. The mayor of New York was a big supporter of the slaveocracy, right? Um, New York was pro, you know, pro the South New York City. Uh, Catholic Church hierarchy, the Irish American establishment and the Catholic press. These were the leading forces, you know, pushing the Irish immigrants in this new direction. And Tammany Hall, right? So Alan goes into this and you'll find it, again, very interesting. And he closes volume one talking about what I mentioned about when I was talking about the back cover of the book. Um, Northern bourgeoisie abandons reconstruction because under Reconstruction, to maintain social control, they had to have standing armies down south. And at a certain point, they say, wait, no, no, we're pulling these armies out, you know, and we're going we're gonna to live. We, we can live with that southern white supremacist system, you know, and, we, and, and that's what they do. And it supported reestablishment of social control system of racial oppression based on racial privilege for laboring class whites. That's the key, because they're always going to give class privileges to the upper classes, right? Uh, the laboring class whites with regard to free land, immigration and industrial employment. The Negro exodus of 1879, when blacks were trying to flee the South and it gets beat back is one key example. And the cotton mill campaign, people are not familiar, the industrialization of the South and the cotton mill industry really white, right? Mm -hmm. and that's, so it, it's, and they're setting up pri these pr race privileges, the immigration, uh, v very much a white, uh, a white skin privilege, right? Um, so he ends volume one, and what he's basically argued in volume one, just one more time, we'll go through this, he talks about religio-racial oppression against the Irish Catholics, that Protestant ascendancy is a, a form of racial oppression, religio-racial oppression. He describes national oppression in the Anglo-Caribbean, in Barbados, in Jamaica. 
He describes racial oppression in Virginia and Maryland. He talks about how racial oppression in Ireland, in Greater Ireland, gets transformed into national oppression when they allow the Irish bourgeoisie to have some degree of control through most of the island, but when England keeps Northern Ireland and Belfast, Ulster, as a basis of racial oppression, and that's their bedrock, you know, to maintain control there. So here in the same country, they're doing racial oppression, national oppression, right? And how the same people who were victims of racial oppression in Ireland became white American defenders of race. So clearly he's arguing it's racial, it's not forever, it's not innate, it's created, it can be, you know, it can be shifted and changed and all of this, right? So now we go to volume two. Again, this is the book that he considers his master work. This is how it develops in this country. So I, and again, I encourage people, if you're gonna read anything, read this volume two first. All right. With the conceptual groundwork laid, what he tried to do in the first volume as it, as it came out is free us of what he calls the white blind spot, right? You know, move beyond just thinking in terms of skin color, look at the nature of the oppression, look at social control, things like that. He turns to the Anglo-American colonies, uh, particularly from the founding of Jamestown in 1607 to 1750. Some key events that he's gonna highlight are 1622, please note that date, the reduction to chattel labor status, Bacon's Rebellion, 1676, 1677. I wanna mention, I'm saying please note, but Fred has done a tremendous job videoing, and we just got this morning number three up. So we've got, uh, number two, but we now have all three previous videos up to two hour videos online. And you'll get this one online too, but we like it when you come and see it live. <laughs> uh, and the 1705 revisal of the Virginia laws, in particular the act concerning uh, servants and slaves. Regarding the English background, and I'm going very quickly, but Allen reviews, and again, this is his training, this is what he, he knows, he taught this political economics, the transition to capitalist agriculture in England in the 16th century. Very important. He talks about England's attempts by legislation in this period, 1547 to 1550, to reduce a portion of their own propertyless class to slavery. This is it, the vagabonds, it's, it's a law, they pass it. They struggle against it and it gets beat back after a period. And he discuss, discusses the reasons the effort failed related to class struggle. He describes the statute of artifices, 1562, 1563, this labor law, which was the balance that was struck in, the, in that atmosphere of some heightened class struggle. And uh, it's the, it becomes, this law, 1563, is the basic English labor law for more than 250 years. Key elements of it, because this is what the colonists bring to Virginia, right? The ones who come to Virginia, this is the law that they're bringing. No slavery, labor is to be paid wages, right? This is not feudalism anymore in England. There's some people, the old, uh, some of the old left analysis used to talk about the South was a feudal, you know, extension of feudal carryover. This is capitalism. This is not feudalism, right? The common problem, then Allen goes into common problems of European colonizing powers, and each of these could be a whole topic one day, but all of the European colonizing powers who are coming over to the new, this Western hemisphere here, right? have a twofold problem. Securing an adequate supply of labor, this is if they're trying to make some profit on this, and establishing a system of social control. You need laborers to do the work to produce, the, you know, so you, you make your profit, but you gotta maintain control. They all have the same problem, but they're doing it in different situations and in different ways. But in both ways, the Anglo-American plantation bourgeoisie we, here in what is now the U.S., in both these respects, we differed from all the other colonizing powers. Where did the early labor come from? And how was control maintained? And this is part of what makes this vicious white supremacy that develops here so unique, right? How it, get, how it gets started here, anyway. Because of these differences. So, regarding Euro-Indian relations and the problem of social control, he goes through Haiti, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Mexico, Peru, Brazil, before turning to Virginia. Key aspects about Virginia, 
which go into the analysis are it's a continental colony. It's not insular. It's not a small island. If it's a continental colony, there's lots of avenue for escape, right? You, 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 so social control becomes real problematic. Also, if it's, a, if it's an island colony, you know, people can go and move out, you know, and still be in the area, as opposed to in the Caribbean, you'd have people fleeing the island if they could get away, right? There is little significant stratification amongst the Native Americans, the, the Powhatan Confederation in Virginia, where the colonists come. That is unlike the Incas, right, and the Aztecs, which had stratified societies, and the Europeans come in and they get the whole system to work for them for a while until so many die and get killed. This is very different. Virginia did not play in that. You know, they, they, they just pick up and go. You know, they're not gonna, it's not going to be the same type thing. And low population density. So that was not going to be their labor supply, right? The, the, the Virginia uh, uh, Native Americans were not going to be the labor supply. So a key difference in the labor supply of all the European colonizing powers, we're talking France, Netherlands, England, um, Port, uh, Spain, Portugal, only England used European workers as basic plantation laborers. That's what we're going to see in Virginia. Right? That's not what's being done elsewhere. I mean, there's a brief attempt at doing it. Barbados, you know, French try and use engage labor very briefly, you know, but it that doesn't work. So that's what's going to, one of the things that makes it so unique. England's unique position, England had a surplus of necessitous poor because England had gone through this capitalist transformation. It was still in the process, but going through it. And there's uh, people being forced off the land, and there's enclosures and stuff, and people are poor, and, and they're, they're surplus laboring population. And for England, for much of the 17th century, that's the cheapest labor supply. Cheaper than anything else they can get. The, the, and, and they'll ship them in various forms, you know, uh, which we'll get into. Cheaper than any alternative source accessible to English plantation prior to the seventh decade of the 17th century. So this peculiarity of the English plantation labor supply was not the cause, but it's an essential condition for what develops later. That, they, they, that there's this surplus of European laboring poor. The peculiarity of the system lay, and this is again, that in what, what's going to get developed here in Virginia, that uh, the buffer social control, the key ingredient to maintaining social control, was supplied from the mass of free proletarians and semi-proletarians. This one gets set up later on. And it excluded all persons of any degree of discernible uh, non-European ancestry. That's where it's going. In Allen's book, he talks, in volume two, he talks about the African migration and the peopling of America. Uh, he talks 10 to 11 million people and how it has shaped the demographics of this of the Americas in general, and he points out that more Africans than Europeans came to the Americas between 1500 and 1800. Most people don't know that, right? And it's such a significant fact in understanding our hemisphere, if you will. He talks about African migration and resistance, pays particular attention to the resistance and rebellion practiced by African bond laborers and their descendants particular attention to the Haitian Revolution, which ushered in an era of emancipation that ended chattel bondage in the British West Indies, US, Cuba, and Brazil. And he points out, and I think this is important, that it was in Haiti that Simon Bolivar twice found refuge before sailing forth in his efforts to end colonial rule in Latin America. So we got these important ties, right, that we want to build off of. Now Alan um, examines the Virginia Charter, 1606. This is what they, be, J Jamestown is 1607, right? This is what they got to get come here with. This is the charter that they got to function under. The, the people who come shall have all liberties, franchises, and immunities of free denizens of the subjects of England. You got to have the laws of England got to apply. You saw what the law for labor was, right? Wages and no slavery, right? That's going to be the law that they bring. In the beginning, from the beginning, Allen is very clear. He asked the question, and then he answers it. Was it capitalism? And then he goes and he talks about, from its beginning, it was a commercial enterprise. They're all businessmen, and he goes through chapter and verse on their titles, their roles, the money they have, what their aims are. He quotes from John Smith and people like this, all their aim was nothing but present profit. 
They have vowed their faith in rents and commerce as the lifeblood of nations, purely commercial. You know, chapter and verse. He spent 20 years going through these primary records. And that's what he brings. It's not, you know, reviewing some secondary source and throwing in this one stuff and that one says. He's giving you the primary sources and quoting from them, right? All right. Plantations were capitalist enterprises. Again, I want to hit on this because there is, particularly on the left, there are all these, if you read the old literature, it's either semi-feudal or feudal, you know, and that's to apply a, a, a theory on it, right? To apply a theory on, on the South, right? But the means of production were monopolized by one class. Non-owners were reduced to absolute dependence. The products of the plantation took the form of commodities and the aim of production was capitalist. So Alan, at points, will go off and explain this and break it down economically. Now here's what concretely happens in Virginia. The Powhatan Indians in the vicinity of, of Jamestown were well provisioned. They had been living there for quite some time and they were getting by pretty well when the uh, English came. In the first decade or two, the English lacked the preponderance of force. They didn't come as conquistadors like the Spanish and stuff. So the Indians had the upper hand, you know, f physically and things like that. And um, the Indians knew how to survive here. There was a great period, as they called it the starvation time. The colonists, had, had, they almost got wiped out in the early period, right? Um, but uh, after this, uh, tobacco was first uh, de developed by the Europeans in 1612, they, they start, you know, planting it and growing it. Um, there's increasingly a move towards production of tobacco. And in the early period, as they're trying, the key, one of the key tasks was to get more people to populate the colony. And they go into England to get it. And in the early period, anybody who came was getting paid. Their passage was paid free. I mean, people don't know, you know, we've heard all these other things. You're going to be a laborer. You're going to be a tenant and a half. Your passage is being paid. And the person who pays for you gets a head right, 50 acres of land, right? They, they were trying desperately to get people here because they wanted to start, particularly as tobacco production increased, they wanted to start making some profit on it. Um, but so what they started also doing was uh, issued warrants for transport of malefactors and other, so that then they started exploring some intermediate forms of labor, less free. This is still before the Africans come, right? No Africans yet. So imprisoned convicts they start bringing to Virginia, vagrants, maids for wives, women who are going to be brought here, right? Women, not women, women who are going to be brought here and, and be, you know, a maid for, <laughs> be a maid who becomes a wife. Duty boys, these are youth, youth coming out of these uh, institutions and homes who are going to be shipped, they were shipped on a, a ship called the duty, so they're called duty boys, right? And all these intermediate forms. The first Africans come in August of 1690. There's supposed to be a food shortage in Virginia. This is what the colonists, the elite in the colony, are telling people back in England. But they trade food, when I mean, there's a shortage of food, for 20 and odd Negroes and Allen. But the status of the Negroes, whatever their status was on the ship or, you know, or wherever they, they're coming from, when they get here, there's no slavery, right? So it, you know, they're going to work, right? But, but other people are working, but it's not slavery uh, as we know it, right? And um, Allen points out that the readiness to trade food for these workers is consistent with a policy of reducing costs by inducing an oversupply of labor. So at points, he breaks into the economic analysis of why things are being done. Here's the 1619 arrival. Here's the key date. I am asked you to note 1622 before. On this date, 22 March 1622, the Powhatan Indians, under their chief, Opa Can Canal, mounted in relative terms the strongest effort ever made to halt the Anglo-American occupation of Indian lands. On that first day alone, they wiped out one-third of the Virginia colony. Within the next year, another one-third <coughs> died. Of the survivors, two-thirds were not fit for work. So, uh, the situation for the elite, the colony elite seized on this opportunity, seized on this crisis, and embarked on a scheme whereby tenants and workers were reduced to unpaid long-term bond laborers. What happened is after this Native American attack, there were, lo there were laws passed. You couldn't go out far to, to grow crops or to go hunting or anything. It was prohibited, right? 
partly because of the danger, partly they didn't want people running away. They were trying to maintain what they had. And the people, the people, the colonists of Virginia were dependent on those who controlled the, the limited food supplies that they had. And that ruling elite proceeds to impose new laws and new legislation. So the laboring classes were dependent on the bourgeoisie for corn. That's the food they were eating. They were compelled to submit to the condition dictated, the status of bond laborers. By spring of 1622, contracts were appearing containing an unprecedented, unprecedented provision allowing the employer to dispose of the servant to the employer's heirs and assigns. People are becoming chattel. They can be bought and sold and passed on. Qualitatively different than England, where the, the, the law is from, right? The massacre of the tenantry, the main relations of production, these capitalist relations in the early period for the laboring people, they, you might be an apprentice, you might be a paid wage laborer, or you might be a tenant at half. A tenant at half, you work the land, you keep half the pro produce, and you turn over half to the person who owns it. But these are capitalist relations of production. In early period, uh, many people were tenants, right? But in chattel bond servitude, the custom of the country was imposed from 1622 on, and they wiped out, for the most part, these tenants. And it's imposed primarily on European Americans, because that's primarily who's there, right? Chattel bond servitude, I want to emphasize this. What gets developed in Virginia is a qualitative break from English labor law. It's a break from the statute of artifices. It is not a feudal carryover. Under feudalism, uh, there, there would be a two-way bondage, but this is a one-way bondage. You know, they can do what they want, but you've got no rights. In, uh, or uh, um, imposed as a custom of the country. And, um, oh, this phrase. This is what they use. When they start putting people up as, and being able to treat them as chattel and assign them, they start referring, it, referring to it in the laws of Virginia as the custom of the country. Just like they don't like to you know, call things what they are, that's what they did back then, the custom of the country. So when you start hearing all this talk about indentured servants, you say, wait a minute, because we're going to get into the numbers in a second. And it's not an apprenticeship. All right. Here are the numbers. Please pay attention here. Of the 92,000 European Americans brought to Virginia and Maryland, between 1607 and 1682, mostly to Virginia, <coughs> over three quarters were chattel bond laborers. Chattel bond laborers. The great majority of them in Eng uh, English. In 1676, the governor estimated 1,500 coming a year. Such recruitment was generally coercive. Few were wholehearted volunteers arriving with written contracts. Many were kidnapped. Some were ordinary convicts, and still others were prisoners taken in rebellion, right? It's not what we've been told that all this great majority of people are coming, so willingly signing indentures to come. That's not what's going on, you know, but that's what we've been taught, right? Now, in this early period, as they developed chattel bond labor, it's important to understand that it really attacked the family, too, right? So for a quick capital turnover, this is where Alan breaks into some of his economic analysis, the importation of unmarried laborers was preferable. Marriage was incompatible with chattel status. The employing class outlawed sexual and family life amongst the limited term bond laborers. So it's really not much of a life, you know, even if you think you might get your, your, your freedom in five or six years or whatever. Fornication and adultery were punishable by fine whipping or imprisonment. Right? Women were exposed to special oppression and attacks on family life. Uh, Virginia bond laborers uh, forbidden by law to marry. The offending wife servitude should be twice that. They really hit the penalties hard on women in this area and many others. It was made a crime for a minister to perform a marriage of a bond laborer without owner's approval. Law made children of such marriages illegitimate. Regarding African Americans, in the 17th century, the lives of African American and European American laborers and chattel bond ser servants were very similar up through 1676. You will find this in Lerone Bennett Jr.'s Shaping of Black America also. So read how Bennett describes it. He says it's not a Garden of Eden, you know, but there was a great, you know, so, I mean, these are tough conditions, right? 
at which time three quarters of the battle, chattel bond servants were European. Life expectancy was low. Most didn't survive the first year. I mean, this was tough, right? Most of the plantation laborers in the 17th century Virginia were limited term bond laborers. The status of African Americans in the 17th century, they, if, if they weren't a bond laborer, they could exercise marriage rights. They exhibited social mobility. They could have and did have some significant land holdings. Some were owners of European American bond laborers. They manifested many forms of resistance. They could testify in court. They could vote. Hear what I'm saying, all right. The record makes clear that the relative social status of African Americans and European Americans at that time can be determined to have been indeterminate. It wasn't set up yet, right, but, but later develops. It was being fought out in the context of the great social stresses and the issue of slavery versus freedom was being fought as a component of the class struggle of the bond laborers and the impoverished one-third of the free population against the large engrossing class. Here's the case of Elizabeth Key. We've mentioned this before, but this is very important, very important for understanding family relations and a host of other things. She's the child of a European-American father and an African-American mother. She was scheduled to complete her term of servitude. When the estate to which she was bonded sought to impose lifetime bond servitude status on her. See, there was, there was a disposition by some of the plantation owners. They'll try and, they would extend servitude where they can if anybody was vulnerable from three to four or five years. And in, in the case of Africans, they would try and extend it to a lifetime if they could, right? So here's a, it's a rendition of Elizabeth Key, right? So her case is significant for the following reasons. In 1656, she, first off, it's significant because she goes to court. It's a right that black people are going to be denied a century later. They're not going to be able to do this. She goes to court and she prevails. She wins. And she makes two arguments. The traditional English principle that her Christian baptism barred her from being held as a lifetime bond laborer. Sometimes that one worked, sometimes it didn't, you know, for people. And the common law principle, common law for centuries in England, that the social status of the child followed that of the father. Right? That's the law. In, if those principles prevailed, they would have prevented the establishment of racial slavery. Plantator, planters you know, started realizing, wait, this isn't the direction we want to take it, right? So in 1662, they took a different course. Descent through the status of the father, the Latin phrase they used was partis sequitur patrum. They changed to partis sequitur ventrum. It's going to follow the status of the mother, right? A qualitative change in law, a qualitative change in family relations. As I've mentioned previously, when I was growing up <laughs> in grad school, and uh, they gave us books to read, one of the big books was by a guy named Gutman, The Black Family and Slavery and Freedom. Starts it in 1790. Doesn't talk about this. This is the significant qualitative change, the type of things that we have to pay attention to. Um, Allen argues in this early period, the white race did not exist. We, we know the words not being used. The attitude of the laboring class Europeans stood in sharp contrast to enactments whereby the plantation bourgeoisie would press for lifetime hereditary bond servitude. So the invention of the white race at the beginning of the 18th century can no, in no part be ascribed to demands by European American laboring people for f privileges vis-a-vis. -vis. They weren't the ones pushing these demands. Uh, the Dutch and African bond laborers, this is also very important. The English bourgeoisie finally secured direct access to African labor after, uh, at the end of the Second Dutch War. England in all that early period, one of the reasons it's cheaper to bring these English laborers, but um, they didn't really have access to the uh, African labor that was, you know, in, in at least up in, in this point, it would have been much too costly to bring them all the way up here. In Barbados, they would be bringing, you know, some African labor down there. But 1672, the Royal African Company was established by English bourgeoisie, and within less than 40 years, Royal African Company would make English merchants the preeminent suppliers of bond, African bond labor. So they got to move to a, a status of preeminence. But even from 1670 to the end of the century, to the end of the 17th century, still in that period, three quarters of the bond laborers coming to Virginia are European. It's not like it's a quick, you know, total transition. All right, here's the numbers. 1671, 8,000 of 15,000 tizables in Virginia were bond laborers, 6,000 European, 2,000 African American. 1680 to 1670, 
30,000 European Americans would come, 24,000 bond laborers. The majority of people coming from England are bond laborers, right? And in this period, we start to see the growth in African bond labor, 6,000, but it's still not at the level the, the English is, still. I mean, it's going to change. But, um, so then we have Bacon's Rebellion, which we've talked about briefly. There were 10 laboring class and bond servant revolts in the period from 1660 to 76. What Allen argues is one thing that clearly Bacon's Rebellion, it starts out as a, uh, a, a struggle within the elite and sub-elite over the rate of expropriation of land from the Native Americans. The sub-elite are the group on the make. They want, they want to move more aggressively. The established elite likes things the way they are. In the second Civil War stage, the people at the bottom of society get involved. They start demanding their, de they put forth their demand for freedom. Um, what Bacon's Rebellion shows in that entire period, argues Allen, is the lack of a sufficient intermediate stratum. They didn't have a good effective, the ruling elite, didn't have a good effective system of maintaining social control in Virginia. So this is a big problem. Here they, in, in Bacon's Rebellion, they kick out the governor, they burn Jamestown, and the rebels control six-seventh of the colony for nine months. It, social control is a big problem, right? Here's Jamestown burning. The problem of social control, Allen argues, was solved by the invention of the white race. The masses of the European Americans could not be promoted to the petty bourgeoisie, because if they promote the masses of them, then they cut all their profits, right? If these people, so they, they want to keep them as, as laborers and working. But they're going to sell them something else. They're going to sell them this white race thing. They could still be assigned a status designed specifically to involve them, and they could then help in social control. They're not even getting pushed out of the class, but now they're becoming helping them maintain social control, which is the big problem. And so after a decade and a half of deliberation, they revised the Virginia laws enacted in 1705, formally codified the new arrangement. The essence of the process was to provide for all European Americans, however lowly their social class, a system of privileges vis-a-vis -vis all Afro-Americans and designed to insulate European Americans from competition with African Americans. A new social status was to be contrived, a white identity designed not only to set European laborers and bond laborers at a distance, but at the same time to enlist European Americans of every class as supporters of capitalist agriculture based on chattel bond labor. So they're bringing them into the social control system. The introduction to this kind of fit of social mobility was to reissue long established common law rights incident to every free man but in the form, remember what I said about Allen, these are rights. They're coming with the, with the laws of England, the rights of the England. These are rights now turned into privileges that are going to make the slavery, the racial slavery possible. So here, presumption of liberty, the right to get married, right to carry a gun, right to read and write. Right to testify in legal proceedings, self-directed uh, physical mobility, male prerogatives over women, right? They, they were, that was allowed in England, and they became race privileges here in America. Laws against free African Americans, not only the chattel bond laborers, but the free African Americans. Denying free African Americans the right to hold office from being a witness. You're not going to have any more Elizabeth Keys, you know, making cases, right? Uh, any free Negro subject to 30 lashes for lifting the hand against the European, right? Self-defense in any form, outlawed. Excluding free African Americans from the armed militia, unlike Jamaica and Barbados and the, and the militia down there. Forbidding free African Americans from possessing any gun. Forbidding non-Europeans to be owners of Christian. Making free Negro women tithable. Propagandizing people in white supremacy. They, this thing wasn't set up yet. So they had to propagandize. They had to use the church walls and the courthouse doors to tell people what it meant. You're white. <laughs> you got here. So the ruling class took special pains that people were propagandized in white supremacism. And these provisions were included in the laws that mandated that parish clerks post this stuff. <coughs> this was the mass media of the day, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that the sheriffs post on the counter, uh, courthouse door. The general public was regularly and systematically subjected to uh, si official white supremacist agitation. 1723, very key. The Virginia Assembly passed an act, no free Negro, mulatto, or Indian 
shall have any vote at the election. Governor William Gooch, the governor of Virginia, in England, they said, well, if people own property, why can't they vote? We've been through this, right? We, if people own property, why can't they vote? So Gooch had to break it down to the English back in England, the way we do things here. He goes, we did this to fix a perpetual brand upon free Negroes and mulattoes. Mm. That's the reason. That's the reason he tells England. Allen argues, surely that was no unthinking decision. Right? That's Jordan, right? Unthinking <laughs> decision. Rather, it was a deliberate act by the plantation bourgeoisie. It meant repealing an electoral principle that had existed in Virginia for more than a century. Black people, if they had property, had a right to vote in Virginia. It's taken away. A brand is going to be put on every black person, right? That was the 1723. Yeah. The expl explanation came, it took a while for the correspondence to go back. Then Allen asked, why the exclusion of free African Americans, right? Why? Same question, essentially, that they're asking in England. And there was a marked tendency to promote a pride of race among white people. This was the real reason. The exclusion of free African Americans from the uh, intermediate stratum was a corollary of the establishment of white identity as a mark of social status. Remember when the question came up early in the class today about social security? I mean, this is the same thing. You're excluding blacks, right? It's to help identify white, right? Um, laborers were not promoted out of their class. The European American laboring people not being promoted out of their class. He cites the work, and these are very well-respected historians, Jackson Turner Maine, Aubrey C. Land, who do very detailed analysis. About 60% of the adult white male population were not owners of bond laborers and were put in competition with the owners of bond laborers. So what Alan argues, we're almost finished here now, the white race social control formation, it was invented as a ruling class social control formation. Its distinguishing characteristic was participation of the European American laboring classes. Because it's not in their interest, right? But they're the cement, they're the mortar that holds it in place. In time, this white race social control system begun in Virginia and Maryland would serve as the model of social order to each succeeding plantation region of settlement. Allen closes his volume two in 1997 at the end of the 20th century. What he writes then, what are we, 17 years later, it's gonna sound very familiar. The social gap between the Titans and the common people is it perhaps at its historic maximum. Real wages have trended downward for nearly two decades, let's say three and a half now. Huh? Entitlements and welfare as they relate to students, the poor, and the elderly have become obscenities in the lexicon of society. There is less a socialist movement today uh, uh, than there was 100 years ago, an anti-capitalist class consciousness hesitant to even call its name. Class struggles and epithet cast accusingly at the mildest defender of social welfare. But Allen felt, despite that situation, that there were unmistakable signs of maturing social conflict because of intensifying conditions, he emphasized that the important fact that we do bear the indelible stamp of the African American civil rights struggle of the 60s, we learned from that, we can build off that, we, and we've got to build off it. Um, and his final words when he's writing in, in 1997, he is 78 years old, perhaps by virtue of that legacy in the impending renewal of the struggle of the common people, and that common people is a phrase both Allen and Harrison use as I mentioned before, with great affection, and Titans, the great safety valve of white skin privilege may finally come to be seen and rejected as the incubus, as the devil that for three centuries has paralyzed the will of these European American workers. He looks further ahead, as, as we look further ahead, we want to learn the lessons from Allen. I mentioned to somebody before class started today, first time I saw Allen speak was in 1969 at a place down on 14th Street, maybe there's some old time called Alternate You. It was a little bit like this. You know, there'd be classes like this. And he gave a talk, and he talked on uh, that white blind spot pamphlet that we mentioned earlier, and can white radicals be radicalized? And he talked about the three previous crises. And for me, that was something that just stuck with me. And I didn't get to know him really until another four or five years later. But learn the lessons of history. In three previous periods of national crises, this is what they've turned to to beat us back. Let us learn this lesson, right? The key to defeat a force of democracy, labor, and socialism 
was achieved by ruling a class appeals to white supremacism by fostering white skin privileges of laboring class Europeans. He emphasizes in that five stage cycle the crucial importance of struggle against white supremacy at all stages, but particularly three and four when there's been overtures of coming together and we know they're gonna to turn to appeals to white supremacy to break us, we gotta be prepared. We gotta beat them back, right? Learn from Hubert Harrison. The Negro, politically the Negro is the touchstone of the modern democratic idea. Every issue we look at in this society, how are, ba how are black people faring and what are we gonna do about it? That's our test, every issue, right? And, that, and with the understanding, if we do this, that true democracy and equality, if we can start moving in that direction, implies a revolution startling to even think of, which we saw glimpses of in the 60s, right? And close with Alan and his insights. This is, I think, the last slide. Remember, the white race was created as a ruling class social control formation. It has served as the principal historic guarantor of ruling class domination in the US. And efforts at radical social change in the United States should understand and reflect the centrality of struggle against white supremacy. I think that's it. Yep. Right on time, Fred. <laughs> we got time for a few questions if people want to ask any. Um, when they talk about basically making um, whatever determines your race matrilineal, I was wondering if um, that has something to do with sexism. Because at least when colonies were first being settled, it was mostly men coming over. Regarding um, the sexism and the gender oppression, I think if you go to Allen, particularly volume uh, well, Volume 1 and Volume 2, uh, I think particularly in Volume 2, we, I, I, I made sure in the index to put where he does some in-depth detail because there was all, both in England, you know, going back, I mean, the history of gender oppression and what's brought over here and how it gets implemented and then how there are new forms here. I think you'll find it very interesting. I, I have a question here. And I just want to say one thing before I get to your question, Sheila, if I may. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to a meeting. Um, I don't know if, this is a slightly off topic here, but not too much. Uh, a woman named Yuri Kochiyama, people may know the name, a longtime activist, and I'm going to a meeting. We're gonna, we've had three West Coast uh, memorials uh, for her. She passed away recently, I think in 93. And um, there's gonna be one September 27th in New York. I'll have a lot of information at the next uh, meeting. I'll probably get some of you whose addresses I have information before then. Um, and there'd be a lot to do, and I think it's going to be something people would want to relate to in various ways. A very outstanding woman, people may or may not know her, but if you're not familiar, Japanese-American um, from California through the internment camps, through the founding of, uh, uh, kept a diary since 1937, major work, right? Um, active in the Asian movement, the Latino movement, um, uh, the general civil rights movement, very p prominently active with black activists, Malcolm most prominently when she's the one holding, his, holding his head at the Audubon Ballroom, and um, political prisoners, maybe 6,000 letters of correspondence with political prisoners over the years. Uh, so the family's also trying to place her papers. I mean, there's much going on. But she and her whole family, and all, her, her family and friends, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be a good place to be, and I'll get you the information. Oh, Sheila, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, oh, and Sheila, by the way, very nice shirt. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if these are still available. Yeah, yeah, we, we went like five. <laughs> I was going to say that, that law about uh, natural mirror, it really foreshadows an era of uh, mass rape. Yes. Uh, African Coupled with, the, with, coupled with the you can't defend yourself. Right? Yes. Exactly. Yeah, very good point. It's one of the reasons why they wanted, that's what you were saying, is that because, and, and it really was uh, gender oppressive, because the idea was that bourgeois men could have sex with, it, with um, black women uh, who were enslaved. Yeah, uh, quite uh, uh, But my, my question was, uh, you, you made a comment uh, about some criticism of people who go out and talk about whiteness. And did you remember that? Well, I, yeah, I remember talking about whiteness and racism, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah. so it's a sort of two-part question. That, yeah. that 
And the second thing is you m mentioned the word trauma in association with the word whiteness. And I'm wondering if that has any relation well, to Well, the white the race identity trauma. Joy, joy, no, no, I don't think Alan was referring to that. When Alan's using it, he uses white race identity trauma as a hurt. He, he, thinks, he thinks, as I've said, there's nothing progressive in white identity. He thinks the struggle for European Americans is to be human, to oppose white supremacy, to challenge white supremacy, which is very different than people who write books white like me. You understand what I'm saying? Alan is taking this in a whole different direction. Alan's saying there is nothing positive or progressive in white identity. Yeah, for your and he's not, he's not even handed. He's not saying the same thing about black. He's not saying don't, you know, don't, because being black poses a challenge to white supremacy. But for, for European Americans, he's saying there's nothing positive or progressive in white identity. Here's its history. Here's, here's who was promulgating it. Here's who was putting it on the walls and the church doors. And, and here's the reason why. S the struggle, he, he, he said for him, his struggle was to be human, you know, to struggle against white supremacy. Um, and thank you all very much for coming. It's nice to see everybody again. And, uh